Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Becca and this is my channel where I talk about all the houseplant things. And today is a very exciting video because we are going to talk about the easiest plants from each genus. And I want to start by saying that an easy plant is a very subjective phrase. Um, not every plant is going to be easy to every person. I have made the mistake of saying that plants were easy and then the comments are full of people saying that it's not. <laughs> so I just want to start with that little caveat. We are going to talk about plants from my personal experience and the experiences of people around me that have been seemingly the easiest. And if you can forgive me for having this microphone right here, the microphone that is attached to my camera is kind of broken half the time. And this is an important video and I don't want the audio to be bad and have to refilm it. So we got a backup right here. <laughs> so just to go back a few steps, whenever I'm talking about a plant genus, I'm talking about the first word in the plant's botanical name. And that is the word that is capitalized. So we're looking at Monstera, we're looking at Philodendron, Hoya. And when you are naming plants by their botanical name and you're writing it down, the genus is capitalized and then the species, which is, you know, Monstera deliciosa would be the species, that is lowercase. So with that being said, we're going to start off with the first genus, which is the Monstera. Monstera are endemic to South America, which means that they come from South America. And based on my research, I'm finding that there are between 50 and 60 recognized members of the Monstera family. I actually found a paper off of aeroid.org about Monsteras, and this is from 1977, so it is quite old, but it is interesting to know sort of where the plant started. I, I kind of like knowing the history of plants. In 1693, Monstera first appeared in Western literature in an account of the vegetation of Martinique by the French botanist Charles Plumier, and he actually provided an illustration of the Monstera adansonii. The text included information about the root system, the stems, and the leaves, and also its use to the native population. It says that they actually used it for snake bite remedies. So if you want to learn more from that paper, I will have it linked down below if you're interested in having a read. But let's talk about the easiest species in the Monstera genus. In my opinion, let's let's say that in my opinion, <laughs> that would be the Monstera deliciosa. So the Monstera deliciosa is the most iconic Monstera. I mean, it's probably the most iconic houseplant in general. You know, you see that plant and you know that you've seen it before, whether you've traveled or you've walked into a mall or a plant store, that plant is gonna be for sale. <laughs> it starts off from very tiny leaves and then they grow into a magnificent plant that is truly a force to be reckoned with. I have actually started a Monstera from a very, very tiny leaf, and now it is a part of my larger Monstera that now lives in my bedroom under a grow light, and it is huge. Like, it was overwhelmingly huge, and I just think that is such a cool thing to have a houseplant that gets that big so fast, because when you are first getting into houseplants, you're going to want to find those plants that give you that quick satisfaction of knowing that you are doing the right thing. So seeing the plants go from having no fenestrations to lots of fenestrations and even midrib holes, it's just very exciting. And as far as the care goes for Monstera deliciosa, I find it very, very easy. The plant is one that is vocal, which is something that I really appreciate in a plant. So when I say that it's vocal, I just mean that when it is thirsty, it will show you signs. I think most of the plants in my collection are just like that. So sometimes plants will get wrinkly, sometimes plants will get droopy, sometimes the leaves will start curling. And of course you want to water them before they get to that point, but sometimes it's, you know, you forget and it's nice to have like a visual of like, oh, that plant needs water. <laughs> so when it comes to growing the Monstera deliciosa, it's really less about giving instructions on how to grow it. And it's more about giving instructions on how to tame it. So as early as you can, I would suggest putting your Monstera deliciosa on a trellis or a moss pole or just something to hold it in place and hold it upright 
because it is a climbing plant. It's an epiphyte, which means that it's going to grow up other plants in its native environment. So if you've ever been to Florida or you've ever been to South America and you look up, you're going to see Monstera deliciosa climbing the trees and you'll see that they have these really long roots that come back down to the ground or they attach actually to the tree itself to hold itself and anchor it in place. And so you can recreate that look in your own home by using a wood plank or a trellis or whatever, whatever you have available to you. But it's really important that you tame this plant early on because if you don't, it has a tendency to just kind of grow in a bunch of different directions. And that might seem like really fun and cute until it gets really, really big and you realize that you have a monster on your hands. Like the Monstera Deliciosa turns into a monster. <laughs> Definitely make sure that you're taming it. Make sure that you're giving it really nice, well-draining soil, a nice chunky soil mix. I have my Monstera in De La Tanks, and I would say it is the plant that is like absolutely the happiest in that soil. There is a big Monstera plant on the bag of the soil, and in my mind, I'm like, yeah, it is the iconic plant to use with De La Tanks. So yeah, if you are interested in Monstera Deliciosa, surely you can find them in your local nurseries or online. There's lots of online stores that sell them as well. And it's also really fun because you can find them in other varieties. So there's lots of different types of variegated Monstera deliciosa, as well as other types of Monsteras. Lots of plants will have a variegated version, which just means it's a version with multiple colors on the leaves. And so you have the Monstera Thai constellation, which is a more creamy variegation. And then you have the Albo Monstera deliciosa, which has really white variegation. And then also there's the Aurea, which has a more gold yellowy variegation. And I'm pretty sure that there's probably at this point several other versions, but those are the ones that are the most popular. It's just a great plant all around to have in your space to make a really beautiful green spot. And it really brings in the jungle vibes. So it's definitely a favorite of mine. The next genus we're going to talk about are Anthurium. Anthurium are such a beautiful genus and there are over a thousand recognized species within the genus, which is absolutely incredible. Now, according to airway.org, they are an endemic from Mexico all the way to Northern Argentina and Paraguay. A lot of Anthurium are well known for their velvety leaves. Some of them have really beautiful silvery veining in them. And I've noticed that a lot of the ones that I have in my personal collection have a little sparkly element to them. Now they are a little bit more difficult on the care scale. So that's why I'm really excited to share with you the Anthurium that I think you should try if you want to get into them, but you're kind of not sure where to go. And my recommendation would be the Anthurium vicii. The care is very similar to the Monstera deliciosa. So that is, you know, medium light and water it when the leaves feel a little bit thin and not as crunchy. I, I don't know how else to describe the Anthurium vicii leaves, but lots of plants when they're full of water, their leaves feel pretty stiff. But when they're starting to get thirsty, the leaves will obviously not be stiff anymore. So what I do with my VGI is I just go over and I like will touch the leaves just to see how thin or thick the leaves feel or how firm they feel more than anything. And if they do feel a little soft to me, I will water it at that point. And I have it also potted in De La Tanks. And there's been lots of people who have given me feedback on Anthurium care. So I'm not really a person who's going to be like the poster child for how to take care of Anthurium. I definitely recognize that it is a plant genus that I am not super great at, but it is one that I really try at because they are so beautiful. The next genus we're going to talk about is Hoya. And wow, people love Hoya. <laughs> and I can definitely see why there are so many different varieties. I found a few different numbers when I was researching how many uh, species there actually are within the genus of Hoya, but the most common number I'm seeing is around 500. Definitely more than I will ever collect in my lifetime. <laughs> but in any case, Hoya is endemic to tropical Asia, the Pacific Islands, and parts of Australia, which I guess makes sense that it's unique because lots of other houseplant genuses that we know of 
are mostly endemic to like South America and places like that. There are a ton of Hoya hybrids out there and a lot of them we can collect in our homes. They're available at box stores and nurseries and online. And so because of that, my favorite Hoya species and the one that I find the easiest would be the Hoya carnosa. Now the Hoya carnosa is a probably the most basic Hoya that you can find, but with that, there are so many different varieties of this specific Hoya. So you have the Hoya Crimson Queen, Hoya Crimson Princess, Hoya Compacta, Hoya Crinkle 8. Gosh, there are so many. I'm probably missing a lot of them. But as you can see, there's definitely lots of options to choose a Hoya Carnosa version that is best for you and what you specifically like. But I find that the care on all of these is exactly the same. When it comes to the Compacta, I'm definitely a little bit more careful with this one because if it does get a pest, it's very hard to tell just with the nature of the leaves being so crinkly. But when it comes to other versions like the Crimson Queen, Crimson Princess, I'm a little bit less worried about pests. Although Hoya are not immune to pests, some pests that really love Hoya are of course the mealybug and then most recently we've learned that flat mites really really love Hoya and it's a real big problem because you don't exactly know that the flat mites are there because they are so tiny they're imperceivable to the naked eye. So if you want to learn more about flat mites and pet and prevention with that, I will link a really great video by my friend Adam. He did like a live presentation of his experience with flat mites. And I'm also going to be sharing in future vlogs my experience with flat mites. I've just have for the time being sent people over to Adam because I don't have any content about it currently. But when I do have content for that, I will make sure to update the description box so that it is there and show my process of handling that as I go through it. Something really awesome about Hoya is that their blooms are quite spectacular and a lot of people actually collect Hoya for the blooms. When it comes to flowers, houseplants really are not super exciting but the Hoya has really striking flowers. A lot of them look sort of like a globe of like color. It's just like a puff of color and the flowers look so good you could taste them. <laughs> and you can actually. Some of them will put off nectar and you can taste the nectar and it's very sweet and it's kind of a fun experience. Like it's like an immersive experience with your Hoya. And best part is the different species within Hoya are all fragrant in different ways. So the Compacta kind of smells like chocolate. I've heard lots of really fun things from other Hoya collectors on what their specific flowers smell like. Okay, next up we're going to talk about Alocasia, which is one of those genuses that I had a really hard time coming up with a plant for. So I actually asked my friends on Instagram what plant they would suggest. So I actually have a few recommendations for that one, but take this with a grain of salt because I can't say that I have personally had a ton of positive experience with Alocasia, but I wasn't going to leave it out. <laughs> so based on my research, I found that there are around 90 accepted species of Alocasia and they are endemic to Southeast Asia. And I did see a mention of Eastern Australia. So they do come from a very tropical region, which means that they have high humidity needs. I mean, most of these plants are going to have some humidity needs, but a lot of them can deal with a little bit less if you don't have it. Alocasia is one of those that I have personally had a lot of struggles with, mostly because of that. The humidity is just never high enough for them. And because of that, they're not super happy. And then as a result of that, bugs come. And so spider mites really love alocasia and lots of people who have collected um, alocasia shared with me that they're spider mite magnets. They're just loved by pests. <laughs> so there are lots of different alocasia that you can grow in your home under the right conditions. And then if you live in the right area for it, they can also live outside in your landscaping. I know that next year I'm probably going to try that and I'm really excited about that. But as far as what you can collect in your home, the one that I would personally suggest and the one that I've had probably the best luck with is the Alocasia Maharani. And I don't exactly know why this one is different or why this one has been better. It's just a really beautiful and unique species. And I find it very interesting to watch grow. The leaves come in a sort of like light green color and then they mature into a more 
dusty green color like a more muted green color and they have a really awesome texture on the leaves and when I asked online what people suggested that one did come up quite a bit so that isn't an isolated experience that for me it's good a lot of other people also mentioned it and as far as other alocasia that I've never collected people suggested the regal shield which is a larger leaf alocasia version and the leaves are a really deep um green color they look almost black and that one is a hybrid between the alocasia black velvet and the alocasia like classic elephant ear i believe that's the cross that it is i've heard great things about that one i've never tried it myself because i didn't want to break my own heart but <laughs> a lot of people online did suggest that one so if you are wanting to get into alocasia definitely have pest control measures on hand so that you can take care of it right away um, if you find that the plant is overrun with pests, it doesn't hurt to just completely chop it off at the base and let it regrow its leaves. It'll definitely regrow. It just might take some time and have a plan for humidity set. So if you have a closed environment, like a greenhouse cabinet for it, or if you want to put it right next to a humidifier or just in a more humid part of your home, like a bathroom or next to the kitchen sink, those would probably be the best ways to give it. Um, the best chance. The next genus we're going to discuss are ferns and this one is quite wild because there's a lot of ferns that you can collect as a houseplant but there's even more ferns that just like grow in nature and according to my research there are over 10,000 recognized species of ferns which is just insane i was actually looking as i have with all of the other plants about where they're endemic to and i knew as i was searching that that i would not find a conclusive answer because ferns really grow all over the world just depending on the environment so obviously they're going to grow in those moist rocky shady areas and lots of them are actually epiphytes which means that they don't necessarily need soil to grow but they can sort of grow off of other things like trees and rocks and things like that so with that said <laughs> These very moist, dark environments are kind of difficult to recreate in a home. So lots of people struggle with ferns, but of course there's the random people that like really do well with ferns. And I just want to talk. <laughs> I just want to know what you do or like what you have that I don't, that you can just do this. But anyway, <laughs> if you are willing to grow ferns in a closed environment, like a terrarium, they will definitely be very, very happy. But for a lot of us, that's not really something we're interested in or have the space to do. So as far as owning a fern, I've only ever owned the maidenhair fern, which is commonly known to be one of the hardest ferns to care for. So I did ask online what you guys thought about which ferns were the easiest. And so I have quite the list. So I'm just going to read it off for you. So first on the list, we have a staghorn fern, which is a very unique plant in general. Lots of people grow them like on planks of wood or suspended in the air they are a true epiphyte like probably one of the best examples that i can think of like visually they're super awesome i've never had one but i feel like i should i think that would be a good addition to my home but as far as other recommendations people suggested the bird's nest fern the boston fern the blue star fern, the crocodile fern, and the rabbit foot fern. Much to my joy, a lot of these ferns you can very easily find in a box store or a local nursery or online. And a lot of them actually look very cool. Like for example, the crocodile fern, it's called that commonly because the leaves actually do look like crocodile skin. And then the rabbit foot fern is kind of like a creepy plant because it puts off these like roots. I believe there's something like an aerial root and they kind of wrap around the pot but they look hairy so it looks like a rabbit foot i don't know it's just really cool so i think that if you want some like unique plants those are definitely some really cool options. Um, they're very like, I don't know, Halloween-y, perfect for this month. <laughs> okay, so the next category we're going to be talking about are Marantiseae, which is actually not a genus, but a family. So within the Marantiseae family, we have a couple of genuses that we should be familiar with, or not should, but you know, you might be familiar with. So you have Calathea, Gapertia, Prayer Plant, those are some genuses within this family and I'm just going to talk about this as one category because a lot of the care is very similar and I guess rather recently there were over 200 species of Calathea that were reclassified as something called a Gapertia and so in order to avoid confusion I'm just going to talk about Marantiseae and I fear that I might have already caused a lot of confusion because in my head I'm like 
Does this make any sense? I hope it does. <laughs> so Marin TCA are those plants that everybody knows as being like very, very fickle and very, very touchy. They need quite a bit of humidity. They don't really like to dry out. So just in general, they need more attention and care. And for that reason, they're not exactly a plant that I would suggest to a beginner. But if you are wanting to try, there are plants within Marantisia that are easier. And I find that Calathea, not always very easy, but Gapersha typically are a little bit easier. And then also prayer plants sometimes. In my personal experience, prayer plants have never done super well for me long term, but I have had success with Gapersha. So for that reason, I am going to suggest the Gapersha orbifolia as the plant to try if you want to try a Marantisiae. It has a really nice green colored leaf, which Marantisiae are more known for having like those like really red leaves or the really bright colors. So the Gapersha orbifolia doesn't exactly have that, but as far as care, it's definitely the easier one. I water mine about once a week. I use regular water. I used to use distilled water on the first one that I had and it was perfect, but um, I don't really love when my plants drink better water than me. <laughs> so sometimes I'll bring out the distilled water, but usually I just use tap water and I haven't had a ton of browning on the edges of the leaves. Typically, Marantisia, Calathea, Capertia, prayer plants tend to be a little bit more sensitive to things in your tap water, but so far so good on this latest one that I have. But it has really nice round leaves and it's really exciting when a new leaf comes out because it kind of looks like a little taquito and it's just really cute. So I'd highly suggest that one if you're wanting like a gateway plant to get into the genus or into the family if you want to try it out and see how it goes. And then once you have that one, you can definitely move into other versions of Marantisia, um, maybe more Calathea. But honestly, I find that Capertia are usually the ones that I'm more drawn to. And then also in the prayer plant area, the red Maranta is pretty simple. The lemon lime Maranta is pretty simple. Um, those ones I've had for longer periods of time, but I can't say they've been super happy in my care. Maybe if I gave them a little bit more attention, they would have been happy. The next genus we're going to discuss is Epipremnum or more commonly known as Pothos. This is the genus that holds probably the second most iconic houseplant species, Pothos or the Devil's Ivy. It has lots of different nicknames and there's also lots of versions of this plant out there. And spoiler alert, that is actually the plant that I'm going to tell you to try out if you <laughs> want to try out Epipremnum or just in general if you want to try out houseplants. The Devil's Ivy or the Pothos is a great option. According to my research, Epipremnum are native to Northern Australia and Southeast Asia and there are over 40 species in this genus. And within that, there's lots of versions that we can have in our homes. Definitely the most iconic would be the Pothos, just the Golden Pothos or the Jade Pothos. Those ones are very common in like the fake vine area. Like if you ever buy fake vines, it's probably going to be a pothos. So yeah, it's a great plant. It's definitely a good one to learn how to take care of plants because again, it is very vocal. It does get droopy when it's thirsty. So you're always going to know when it's time. And I find them to be super forgiving as far as care goes. Like, you know, you could put them in, I've seen people put them in like really bad soil and they grow really big and beautiful. Of course, I am going to say that you should put them in a chunky soil mix and water them, you know, maybe every 10 days or whenever the plant is looking a little droopy. They're really nice because you can easily propagate them and they can actually live in water forever. A lot of houseplants can actually live in water forever as long as you're giving them the proper nutrients and you're changing out the water, but pothos are a really good one for this. I'd say they're pretty cool to propagate and share with other people because Everybody has probably seen a pothos before, but they might not know what it is, but they've definitely seen them. And I feel like that um, instant recognition is sort of a, I don't know, it kind of breaks down walls and makes houseplants feel a little bit less scary. Like if you've seen it before, it doesn't feel as intimidating to, to take care of it. Okay, next up we're going to talk about begonia, which is a genus that is native to Central and South America. There are actually no varieties that are indigenous to the United States 
and there are over 2,000 species in the genus. Lots of people really love begonia, and in my mind, there's a couple different categories of begonia. There's the Rex begonia, and then there's cane begonia, and those are the two that I am most familiar with. I am sure that there are more, but the begonia that I am going to suggest is a cane begonia. I just find that cane begonia have a little bit less interest in humidity. Not to say that they wouldn't love it, but anyway, the begonia that I want to suggest to you today is again a cane begonia. It is called a begonia lucerna. Begonia lucerna are one of the angel wing begonias. So I'm naming a lot of categories here. So we've got Rex, we got cane, we got angel wing lots of things to research for you later if you're interested in learning more about begonia. There are actually societies dedicated to begonias and begonia research and begonia collection. There's Hoya people and there's begonia people and those two genuses just like attract people who like really love them. <laughs> anyway, as I said before, the begonia lucerna is a really, really easy to care for begonia. It has really lovely big long leaves that look like angel wings. I mean, they are a part of the angel wing begonia section. They also have really pretty silvery sparkly dots on them. And then the backs of the leaves are a really nice red color. And a lot of begonia do have that on the back. They have a really nice red color on, on the rear of the leaf. The <laughs> You guys, I've been talking for like over an hour. On the rear of the leaf, that's kind of a weird thing to say. I really like this one because again, it's a vocal plant. It will tell you when it's thirsty, it'll droop a little bit, um, and it also flowers. And begonia flowers are very beautiful. They are usually, well, I don't know if they're usually any specific color, but the ones that I've had that have flowered have been a dark pink to light pink color, and they're really cute, and they bloom a lot. When they actually start blooming, they bloom a lot, and it's really cute and exciting. Okay, next up, we are going to talk about Syngonium, which is one of my personal favorite genuses. I cannot for the life of me find out how many Syngonium like species there actually are, but I know if I was to put a number on it, I would guess like between like two to 500. I'm assuming that there's a lot, but the research I'm finding is saying 16 and like that just does not seem right to me. But either way, they are endemic to Mexico in South America. They are quite invasive, so surely they are now found like all over the world in like tropical regions. I've heard from several people in like Indonesia that they are pretty invasive there as well as Florida and just places like that, places where the plant would really enjoy itself. It's really populated. <laughs> Most of the Syngonium that I've collected in my time have been Syngonium podophyllum, which is probably the easiest to achieve and most lovely, in my opinion, Syngonium. There are so many different varieties of podophyllum, like it's literally so many. There's so many different colors. They really remind me of like petunias <laughs> because all of the names are so funny. Like there's just like so many different varieties. But one of the most popular ones I have actually behind me, that's the Albo Syngonium. It's just like a white variegated Syngonium. Um, one of my favorites was probably the white butterfly. I would really like to have that one again. But in my past of having Syngonium, I have found that they are spider mite magnets, which is a really hard thing for me when I have so many plants and spider mites can really decimate a collection pretty quickly unless you get a hold of it. But that's pretty much where I realized that I had spider mites so badly was because all of my Syngonium had spider mites. And <laughs> When I realized that, I really pared down my collection to just a few. And so as far as Syngonium podophyllum, probably the only one that I have is actually the Albo, which is behind me. They're actually very similar to Epipremnum in how they grow and their care instructions, because if you want, they can trail or they can climb, or you could just have them be like a bush and you can keep cutting them back and trimming it. And propagating it and putting it back into the soil. Um, they're very easy to propagate in water and again, very similar to a pothos. So if you've ever had a pothos and had success, I'm pretty much gonna guarantee that you would do well with a Syngonium podophyllum. The next genus we're going to discuss is Philodendron, which is one of the most popular and biggest genuses in houseplants. Based on my research, there are over 400 different species of Philodendron and lots that are still 
unnamed or unidentified, and they are endemic to Central and South America. Philodendron is probably the biggest category of plants that I own. I did a philodendron collection video a couple months ago, and I was actually so surprised by how many I had. I mean, truly, it's so cool to know that you can have so many different species of the same genus, and they all look so different, but they have similarities, and like you understand why they are related. It's like siblings. You know, when you look at a pair of siblings and you're like, yeah, I see how you're siblings. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how I feel about my philodendron. It's pretty fun. So as far as what philodendron I would suggest for you, the most basic answer would be like the Hartley philodendron, which is just a vining plant that makes leaves that look like hearts. And I do think it was actually one of the first species found within philodendron. It's, it was definitely one of the first that was brought to like America, for example. But another one that I would suggest that might be a little bit more unique would be the philodendron Florida. I have a philodendron Florida that I have had a love-hate relationship with for a long time. But upon closer inspection and like thinking about my history with the plant, I think it's a really great option for a beginner because it's very easy to care for. When it's thirsty, it gets a little bit curly. It takes like a basic chunky soil. Thalo tanks would be great, but if you're making your own soil, I think that it would be pretty adaptable. You can make it climb up a pole or a wood plank or even just like a bamboo stick, and it would be really happy doing that. But if you wanted to sort of like see what it did on its own, it kind of like curls up and around and it does some funky stuff. Stuff. So that's what I have mine currently doing right now because I don't really have the space to put it on a pole or a plank. I would like to do that in the future, but it's just kind of funny to see what it does on its own. And really, I neglect it like big time and it has been so happy even still, which I really appreciate. I appreciate plants that can kind of like do their own thing and not need a ton from me. So that's why I think I have a lot of philodendron because philodendron tend to be more like that in the care department. Next genus we're going to talk about is ficus and ficus is a really interesting one because a lot of the ficus varieties are actually not houseplants at all. They are more so like shrubs and plants that you would put outside. And yeah, it's pretty interesting. So there are over 850 species of ficus and they are endemic to Southeast Asia and Mediterranean regions. But of course, ficus trees have been planted everywhere. I mean, I've seen them in California, I've seen them in Florida. So, you know, they definitely would thrive in a lot of different environments. Another one of the most iconic houseplants is probably the ficus lyrata or the fiddle leaf fig and lots of people will go out and get that plant as one of their first house plants and I think that is a bit of a mistake and I did not go out and get one right away thankfully I think I would have really broken my own heart I do have one now and it is pretty happy I think as they get older it's a little bit less picky but as far as a ficus to start off with to just like go and get um, as, a, as your first one, I would suggest the ficus elastica. And there's a couple different varieties within that that you can have some flexibility. So there's the ficus elastica tanique, which is a more variegated version. And it's so beautiful. It looks like it has been watercolored. Like it is... <laughs> so pretty. As with a lot of variegated plants, each leaf will be unique and it's just really cool to see it on this type of plant. The plant is also called a rubber tree and I think that's because the leaves feel kind of rubbery, like they have a really cool like waxy finish on the leaf. I find them to be really cool looking and if you're looking for something a little bit more basic, there's also the Ficus Elastica Burgundy, which is actually the first houseplant that I ever bought. And I don't know if I would suggest a ficus as your first houseplant ever. Ever, but I saw it in the store and I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I actually bought it from Sprouts Farmer's Market grocery store and I'm looking at it right now. That's why I keep looking off behind the camera, but it's really beautiful. It's about as tall as I am now, but when I bought it, it was probably two feet tall and I'm over five feet tall. So it's definitely grown quite a bit in the years that I've had it. The next genus we're going to discuss is Aglionema. And Aglionema is a really cool genus. I don't tend to see people collecting more of the uncommon varieties of Aglionema too often. So you're kind of in luck that the ones that are popular are pretty easy to find. So Aglionema are endemic to Asia. I was seeing mostly the Philippines and there are over 85 different species within Aglionema as a genus. Now, I couldn't find like a ton of 
articles that said the same thing. Like usually articles will all say different things based on the year that the article came out. New plant species are found all the time. So I try to find the most recent article, but yeah, this one says 83 and it's from the plantlist.org. So hopefully that's correct. <laughs> Either way, the Aglionema that I would suggest for you is the Aglionema Silver Bay. It's really, really beautiful. It just, it feels like a, very much like a plant. I don't know. Oh my gosh, I've been talking for so long. I'm running out of things to say. But yeah, it's one of those plants that is a really lovely green spot in your home that is also very low maintenance. It doesn't tend to show that it's very thirsty. So I would say watering it about every 10 to 15 days is probably going to be good. Of course, depending on the size of the plant, mine is a little bit larger. It's in like a 10 to 12 inch pot. So I don't have to water it as often because there is quite a bit of soil in there for that root system. But at the end of the day, it is one of those plants that you probably don't have to put a ton of attention on. Like, I forget that I have mine all the time. And then when I realize that I have it, it's very exciting and fun because it's so beautiful. <laughs> all right, my friends, that is going to be the end of this video. I really hope that you enjoyed hearing about some plant genuses and which species within the genus to try out first. There are so many different ways that this video could have gone because there are so many different house plants, but of course this is just based off of my own personal experience. So definitely make sure that you're doing research on the plant before you buy it and making sure that it lines up with your home to ensure that yeah, this is a plant that will be successful in my home. If you want to learn more about any of these plants, I actually have a plant profile on all of the plants that I mentioned in this video in my book, House Plants for Beginners. So if you do find yourself to be stumbling upon this video and you are super new to house plants and you want to learn more, definitely check out my book, House Plants for Beginners. I will have it linked down below for you. And I look forward to shipping out beautiful signed copies of my book to you to help you get started with your journey. I am going to be selling hardcover and softcover. So depending on whatever you want, it makes a great coffee table book or just something to, you know, read wherever, whatever you're doing. I find the book to be a really great option for people who are super new and just kind of want succinct information from one resource. I obviously did a lot of research to compile the information in the book, but as I was saying with finding out like how many are, how many species are in the genus, there's lots of different answers and you'll probably find that as you're researching houseplants that you're going to find a lot of different answers for why your plant is doing certain things. So I find it best to go off of my my own intuition and find a resource that I really trust and go off of that. So if you are interested in making my book that research, you can check it out down below. And if you liked this video, you kind of, you didn't see as much of my personality in this video, but I am a goofy gal who just loves houseplants and loves to teach about them. So you can subscribe to my channel to learn more and sort of see the day-to-day -day life of owning houseplants because I have over a hundred houseplants and somehow... I keep them all alive. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have you be a part of the De La fam over here on the De La channel for De La plants. <laughs> and if you want to go even further, I do have a Patreon where I do monthly plant clinics. I do special classes. We have a Discord where you can chat with other plant people. It's just a really fun community. So I will have all of that linked down below. My voice is officially giving out. I keep getting like a pain in my throat because I've been talking for an hour and a half. <laughs> So hopefully this video was not an hour and a half for you, but if it was, you're a trooper. Um, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.